Hi, my name is Suzette Phillips. I am here to tell you about a new ministry here at HBC called Kabod Art. I teach adults with disabilities how to paint. Society often uh, pushes them away, ignores them. Um, I believe they were fearfully and wonderfully made before the foundation of the earth. Adults with disabilities, autism, uh, Down syndrome, and any other kind of disability. Even if you feel like you don't have any talent, the Lord will cultivate that talent, bring it out of you, and we will have so much fun, we'll make friends. I've got paint, I've got paper, we'll start easy. Uh, we're gonna have a blast. We're gonna start on April 18th, uh, that's a Thursday at five o'clock. Um, I am uh, so honored to be blessed to teach them how to paint. Lord will bless, all are welcome here at HBC. Kabod art means the, the heaviness of God's glory and we will find it there, it'll be beautiful. Hello, <laughs> how you guys doing? All right, so before we get into worship, I got a couple of announcements for you guys. So if you guys are new and have recently started attending here at HBC, um, we have a new to HBC program. It's going to be April 21st at 2 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. And if you have any questions for the pastors or if you just want to meet them or any of the leadership in the church as well, feel free to attend this. Um, it's going to be April 21st at 2 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. We also have a new believers class. It's a nine-week series beginning Saturday, April 20th at 4 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. Again, Saturday, April 20th at 4 p.m. at the multi-purpose room for the new, be new believers class. And as you saw in the video, Kabod Art Studio is a new ministry for individuals with disabilities 15 years and older. Class is being led by Suzette Phillips and will begin Thursday, April 18th at 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. And with that, please bow your heads and we're going to open us up in prayer. We'll get into some worship here. Dear Lord, I just pray as you bring us into worship, Lord, I pray that you can just allow us to bring glory to your name through this service, Lord. I pray for Pastor Jeremy, Lord, as he brings your message to, to the congregation, Lord. I also pray for the congregation and the church, Lord, to just, I just pray that you continue blessing us as much as you have, Lord. I've just seen it. You know, this church is growing. You're at work here, Lord, and I pray you continue in that. And I pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, HBC. How y'all doing? All right. Let's stand and worship.
into your house this morning, Lord God, that we can come before your presence, that we can offer our hearts, that we can lift our voices, Lord, just to proclaim how great you are, Lord. I pray that you would meet us here. I pray that you would hear our hearts as we continue in worship. In Jesus' name, amen.
you are so good. God, we're just so thankful for all that you do for us. God, we know we're not deserving of it. Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here, God, burdened with life. God, there's something heavy weighing on them. God, I just pray that you'll break those chains. I pray that they will lay that at your feet this morning. God, I just pray that you'll fill us with your spirit. God, fill us with your joy, your hope, your peace that only you can give. And God, I pray that that'll carry with us throughout our week. God, I'm just so thankful for you and all that you do. I'm thankful we can be here together, worshiping you as a family in your house. 
as we continue to worship.
the rising sun to the setting same I praise your name great is your faithfulness to me oh yes Lord Great is your faithfulness to us. Lord, we thank you for that faithfulness. And Lord, we ask that you would accept this worship in the manner that it was given, Lord, that, that it glorifies and honors you. Lord, I thank you. I praise you that we still have the uh, ability and the opportunity to come together and worship you openly, to fellowship together, to pray, to read your word. So Lord, as we go into today's message, Lord, I would ask that you would speak to each of us that your words would be given to us and that we would come to know you in a deeper and a more meaningful way. It's in your precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see you all here today. Um, before we start the service, we're actually going to have a time of uh, prayer and commissioning for our missionaries that are going to be going to Uganda. So if I could have them come forward, if I could have the deacons come forward as well. Um, we are going to pray for them as a congregation, um, and we are going to send them on their way. They're going to be heading out soon, but uh, first I'm going to let uh, Trevor give us a few words about what they're planning on doing in Uganda. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Trevor. This is Matt and Ian. We are the team going to Uganda uh, to support the crab trees, and uh, what we'll do, be doing is VBS and teach an evangelism class. And uh, we just wanted to come in here, come up here and uh, introduce ourselves and ask that you would pray with us as we are leading up to going and also while we were there. Uh, we are having a bake sale in the fellowship hall. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to come ask us uh, then. All right, now if you wouldn't mind uh, bowing your heads, closing your eyes, we're gonna uh, pray together and we're gonna send them um, with our best wishes. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you and I praise you for these men, these men that are answering your call on their lives. And Lord, as they prepare, as they prepare to study, as they prepare to uh, do their VBSs, their evangelism classes, Lord, I would ask that you would guide them, that you would lead them in their study of your word, that their prayer time would be a meaningful time of communication with you. Lord, I ask that you would send them with your boldness, that, Lord, that they would look around and they would see you with, they would see the people around them with your compassion, your eyes, your love. And, Lord, I ask that you help us as a congregation to keep them in the forefront of our prayers, because, Lord, we know from what Savannah said, the great need in Uganda also is a great opportunity. So, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for these men. I ask that you be with them in all that they do, preparing and conducting this mission trip. It's in your precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. All right. Well, again, good morning. Glad you decided to come and uh, worship with us today. Uh, today, we are going to look at how Jesus dealt with the temptation that followed his baptism. I've entitled today's message, Radical Focus, and we are going to look at the focus of Jesus. We're going to be primarily in Luke 4, 1 through 13, and if you don't have a Bible and need one, just put your hands up. The ushers will hand you one. Um, if you don't own one, please feel free to keep it. We want to equip you with everything you need to be able to develop a deep and abiding relationship with God. So I've broken this section up into uh, three things. Uh, first, we're going to look at Luke 4, 1 through 2, the situation. Then we're going to look at the battle itself in 3 through 12. And then we're going to talk about the result in verse 13. And today we're going to be talking about temptation. And temptation is another word for the actions of testing, proving, trying, or for the enticement of doing evil. It's important for us to distinguish between the different kinds of temptation, especially with the way the types are translated from the original words in Hebrew and Greek. There are three kinds of temptation. The first one is the one that we are all completely familiar with. 
This is where Satan tempts people, lures them to do evil. And in the same way, our own sinful nature also tempts us to satisfy ourselves, placing us before God. In James chapter 1, verse 13, we read that God never tempts us, and he himself cannot be tempted. This is important for us to understand for later. The second usage is found when people test God in the sense of provoking him with unreasonable demands that are contrary to an active faith walk. This is what Israel did in the, de in the desert. And this is going to be important for us to understand also because Jesus is going to accomplish what the first man could not. He's also going to accomplish what the children of Israel in the desert could not. The third usage of the word comes from where God tests us, but not tempts, tests us, as he did his people in the Exodus. A good example of this can be seen in the actions of Abraham when he was told to sacrifice Isaac. As we begin today's study, I want to be very clear that Jesus lived the life of a complete human. He was born. He had parents. He skinned his knees when he out, went out playing with his friends. He ate, he slept, all of it. In the sections of scripture that we're gonna look at today, you're going to see that he, was, that he was tempted, that he was hungry. But, and here's the big one, he was without sin. He had the full human experience, but never once was he not God. Never once did he not know his path and never once did he sin. He had a radical focus, one that never wavered, one that we must understand if we are going to be victorious in our battles of temptation. So what is a simple definition of a radical? Um, it means to relate to or affect the fundamental nature of something. It means far-reaching or thorough. And sometimes it's easier for us to understand a definition by looking at the opposite. And what is the opposite of radical? It's superficial. A simple definition of the word focus is that this is a directed attention, a point of concentration and emphasis. The opposite of that is being vague. Jesus had one focus for his life, and it was the emphasis of his existence. The Bible is actually very specific about why Jesus came. In John chapter 18, verse 37, when Jesus is being questioned by Pilate, he says, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Jesus was a radical. He didn't live his life at all like anyone thought he should. He didn't conduct his ministry the way that anyone thought he should. He didn't say the things the people expected. He didn't teach what people thought he ought to. He didn't teach to people that everyone expected either. He didn't have a superficially vague view that everyone seemed to be looking for, but instead he had a radical emphasis on the fundamental issue that all of humanity could not hope to solve apart from the direct personal intervention of God himself. The fact that we could not save ourselves and that we would die an eternal death without him. He instead kept his focus always on his father's will. In Matthew Poole's commentary on the temptation of Jesus, he makes a statement that is important for us to understand. Poole says, Great manifestations of divine love are commonly followed with great temptations. See, here at HBC, we have just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And over the past few weeks, we've seen amazing things. We, of course, had our epic Easter right here, which really started during the prayer times for the youth retreat, their trip, and the obvious moving of the Spirit in their lives. They just had another fantastic night of worship on Friday night, where again it is clear that the Spirit is moving these young kids. We had such great prayer meetings leading up to the epic Easter services. 
where we got to witness many people come forward right here and make a decision for Jesus Christ. Then last week, we had the HBC picnic and we had baptisms in the river. We were able to share our fellowship openly. We were able to boldly proclaim that we love Jesus and that we are going to make a stand for him right here in this valley. Then we had the powerful testimony from Savannah about the missions in Uganda and how great the need is there, but also how great the opportunity is. So this all sounds great, right? So why is it important for us to understand Poole's statement? What this means for us is that when we have those mountaintop experiences, those times of great joy and rejoicing due to the cleansing work of Jesus, which he was happy to do for us, by the way, when we have those spiritually exciting and renewing times, we should expect that temptation will soon follow. Poole completes his thought by saying, temptation usually follows baptism, the beginnings of spiritual life, and covenants made with God. And this makes sense to us, right? Because our enemy wants nothing more than for us to be comfortable, to be at ease. He wants us to make an easy path in life, for us to say, it's too hard to do anything else. I'm just going to stay at home. The temptation of Jesus is found in all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there are differences among those accounts. Uh, Matthew orders the events differently than Luke does, and Mark just mentions that it happened without the details the other two accounts offer. The differences in the accounts shouldn't bother us. They're not contradictions. Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience. Luke was written to a Gentile one. Mark was likely the first gospel account written down, and he didn't write everything in a chronological order. The fact that there are differences actually lends credence to the accounts, not takes away from them. Because the three writers each have their own perspective. The accounts of the temptation have different points in in them, but this leads us to understanding their truthfulness. Those accounts are found in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, Mark 1, 12 through 13, and Luke 4, 1 through 13. Now that we've addressed the differences in these accounts, let's open up our Bibles to Luke 4, 1 through 2, and we're going to look at the situation. Luke 4, 1 says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This section begins with a word that is easy to read past, but it gives us information that helps us to understand what we are about to get into. The word is then. This word strongly connects what we are about to read with what has come before it. Luke presents Jesus as the completion of prophecy. And in fact, through the faithfulness of Joseph and Mary, they take him to the temple after his birth They are then witness to the prophecy of Simeon in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25. And Simeon said of Jesus that he is your righteousness. He has been prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and that he is the glory of your people Israel. Luke then moves the account forward to Jesus at 12 years old and shows him again in the temple. Pastor talked about this last week, where Jesus demonstrated that he is the literal, actual word of God. In Luke 2, 47 through 49, it says, All who heard were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when his mother Mary admonished him from a parent's anxiety, He answered in a way that gives us a clue to the radical focus that Jesus lived his entire life by. He said, did you not know that I must be about my father's work? Luke leaves the rest of Jesus' young life alone, save for 252, where it says Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. 
the next time Jesus arrives in the Luke account is on the day of his baptism, where he demonstrates submission to and respect for the righteousness of God the Father. We don't have time to develop this today, but I will say that the baptism of Jesus was not for the repentance of sin but instead to acknowledge that the path to redemption was to be accomplished through a personal obedience to God. That's why he said to John the Baptist, it is to fulfill all righteousness in Matthew 3, 15. The proof of all of this was God tearing open the sky, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, and the pronouncement that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's one more thing that I want to point out, and it's at the end of chapter 3. And it's the connection that Luke makes in the genealogy of Jesus being the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus is both fully human and fully God. And Luke recognizes this in the listing of a genealogy that goes back further than Abraham as Matthew had had done. Uh, Adam is said to be the son of God because he was the first created by him and the first to be made in God's image. Jesus is the son of God, because, not by creation, but because he shares in the divinity of the father and has done so for all eternity. In the garden before his death, in John 17, five, Jesus prays and he says, and now father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. So that gets us past the first word in Luke 4, 1. We're now going to change pace a bit. And we're going to talk about an error I made while I was outlining this sermon um, as we cruise into the core of this message. I was outlining and I made a list of complications that Jesus had and a a list of assets that Jesus had. And under complications, I wrote that Jesus was alone in the wilderness. And under assets, I wrote Jesus had the spirit with him. Now that would have been a contradiction. And it's not true in the least bit. Jesus always has the Holy Spirit with him. In fact, he, the spirit and the father are one. So not alone. Even textually, we can see that it says Jesus was filled by the Spirit and led by the Spirit. I like how Mark puts it. He uses the word immediately. Mark says, immediately the Spirit drove him. We can use these words, immediately drove, to imply an act of expulsion, of driving out. But in this case, it's meant to convey a fervent urging and leading. I mean, the spirit wasn't whipping Jesus. Now you go to the wilderness. He was a full partner. He was energetic about the work that they had waited so long to accomplish. See, Jesus didn't wait around for things. He was always about his father's work. When one thing was accomplished, it was immediately on to the next. And that's a pretty important aspect of the radical nature of Jesus's focus. He doesn't react the way one would expect him to. He was about the immediacy of the work that God had sent him to accomplish. It says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. When you see this phrase in the Bible, it refers to a location of intense experiences, uh, of a stark need for food and water that was demonstrated in the Exodus where God had to provide the manna, had to provide the food, the water. It's a place of isolation. Think of when Elijah fled from Mount Carmel and went all the way back to Mount Sinai. It's a place of danger, of divine deliverance, of renewal, of encounters with God. And in this case, we can see by what Mark adds to the account that it was a place of wild animals, This is the empty, dangerous wilderness where Jesus had no choice but to rely fully on God and where no one would accidentally or even purposely stop by and intrude. And in this case, we know that there is a purpose for this journey and that Jesus entered into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, Being tempted for 40 days by the devil... And in those days, he ate nothing. 
And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So here, verse 2 begins in the middle of the previous sentence. Likely this was just because the original scribe had reached the end of a page. But regardless, this first part finishes the purpose of Jesus moving out into the wilderness in the spirit. He came to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, we have already talked about several different usages of the word temptation. And I know that this is an area we all have experience in. The difficulty for us is that sometimes we equate being tempted to sin with actually sinning. The reason that we often have feelings of guilt, anger, and sadness when we are tempted is because we know that often we fall to that temptation. Many of us for too long have struggled with temptations and failed. I know that I've done that more times than I care to remember. And that's because we, you and I, we often try to fight in our own strength. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will always make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If we try to fight the temptations of this world on our own, we will likely fail. If we expect to be able to stand under the fiery darts of our enemy in our own strength, we will likely fall. This is why it is so important for us to to follow the example of Christ and see what mirroring his radical focus can do for us. Luke 4, 2 says that he was tempted for 40 days, and in those days he ate nothing. Matthew's account states that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then was tempted. Mark says that he was in the wilderness for 40 days and tempted. There's a reason that Jesus fasted for as long as he did, and he gives us a clue to the reason later in Matthew 17, 20, when his disciples were unable to cast out a demon. They asked him, why could we not cast this demon out? And Jesus replied, this kind doesn't go out except with much prayer and fasting. And if that were true for a demon... How much more necessary would the proper preparation be to go face to face with Satan? And listen, we're talking about Jesus Christ, God incarnate. If he felt that it was necessary to prepare for his spiritual battle with intensive prayer and fasting, how important should we view prayer and fasting? That's a humbling thought, and I hope one that gives us all pause. In 4, 1 and 2, Luke describes the why of the event, the who of the event, and the time frame of the event. The how of the event is somewhat ambiguous, as we will soon see just based on some of the location shifts within the narrative. But the statement at the end of verse 2 is interesting. It said, after the temptation had ended, he was hungry. Talk about an understatement. Because if we look at this through human eyes, we would say, how could he even still be alive? But Jesus is God. And he had the Father with him, the great provider himself. God provided for Moses on the mountain for 40 days. He could certainly provide for his son. We see in John chapter 4, verses 32 and 34, that Jesus doesn't always need food like we do. He says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. We also know, however, that he is fully man. So he feels hunger. He gets tired too. We can see that fell asleep in the front of a boat during a storm. But remember that list that I alluded to? Jesus has assets in this battle because of his radical focus. He is spirit-led, he is spirit-fed, and because of that, he is spiritually ready. 
So now we're going to move on to the battle, starting in verse 3. Verse 3 says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. There's a song from way back in 1985 called The Champion, which does a fantastic job of depicting the battle between Jesus and Satan as a boxing match. If you've never heard it, I highly encourage you to give it a listen. At this point... We've reached the main event, and I almost feel like there needs to be one of those boxing rings announcement. In the black trunks, the fallen star of heaven, the tempter of mankind, the accuser of the saints, and the prince of darkness, Satan. And in a robe as white as snow, the word made flesh, intercessor, wonderful counselor, mighty God, king of kings, Lord of lords, the very son of God, Jesus, right? Nowhere in the Bible, outside of the book of Job, do you see the power and deceit of Satan more than here in Luke and Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus? So let's quickly look at the accuser of this narrative. See, this battle has been on from the very beginning. Lucifer was once the highest of the angelic beings, close to the throne of God. Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19 describes his beauty, his position. He was close to the throne of God, but instead he wanted to be on the throne himself. He wasn't satisfied being the creation. He wanted to be the creator. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, it describes the fall of Lucifer, who wanted to be like the Most High, but it instead is brought down to Sheol, the pit. Satan's pride caused him to not be content with just being a rebel himself, and instead he convinced a third of the angels of heaven to follow him into rebellion. Then we can see what he did in Genesis, where in the form of a serpent, He deceived mankind into choosing to place themselves before God. And the result of that choice has plunged all of humankind into sin and death. Job describes Satan as an accuser of man roving around the earth. Peter describes him this way as well. Jesus says he's a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And in John 8, 44, he says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning not holding to truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and the father of lies. We're going to take a quick detour into the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. The easiest way to find the book of Zechariah is to find Matthew and go back two books, or just plug it in on your iPhone. Here, you see the pre-incarnate Christ and Satan. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. See, when it talks about the angel of the Lord in this section, we can know that it is talking about Jesus because in verse 4, it says of the angel of the Lord that he has removed Joshua's iniquity. And who but God can, can forgive sins? Jesus claims this authority in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8, when he forgives the sins of the paralyzed man. And then he demonstrates that he does, in fact, have that power and authority when the man actually is healed. Zechariah 3 seems to me to be talking all about Jesus. It's one of the messianic prophecies that's found throughout the book. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, It says, if you walk in my ways, if you will keep my command. That sounds like John 14, 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. In Zechariah 3, 8, it says, for behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. And in John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And this is a great one. I wish we had more time to develop it. We just don't. But Zechariah 3, 9 says the Lord of hosts, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. And again, there's so much here to develop and we just don't have the time today. But what I will say 
is that the cleansing uh, that God predicts he will bring to the land in a single day is the spiritual cleansing that Jesus accomplished on the cross in a single day, a day we call Good Friday. This is the day that Zechariah continues to talk about in chapters 9 through 14 when the people look upon the one whom they pierced. This, of all things, demonstrates for us the radical focus that Jesus had. His singular goal of following his Father's will to save us all. Spurgeon said in his commentary of Zechariah 3, when we stand up for God to serve his interests, we must expect to meet with all the resistance that Satan subtly and malice can give us. Let us then resist him that resists us and he will flee. Let's turn now back to Luke chapter 4, verse 3. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. This is Satan's first attack. He says, If you are the Son of God, which is kind of weird. I I was asking myself, what's the attack here? Uh, Satan knew that Jesus is God's Son. Satan did not come here to challenge that, but instead to challenge Jesus to use his divine essence to satisfy his own needs. He was tempting Jesus to take an easier path, one which he would later accuse Jesus with. This is the same tactic that the Pharisees and Sadducees also try against Jesus. See, Satan likes to use subtleness as a tactic even when he's directly attacking. When he presented the case of Job before the Lord, he said, Doesn't he have cause to love you, Lord? He is the sower of doubt and deceit. When he approached Eve in the garden, he said, Did God really say? This is what we are in the the military would call a feint. You try to get the defender to focus on an area that you actually aren't interested in so that you can hit him where it will do the most damage. He was hoping that the human side of Jesus, after a state of hunger, after 40 days of fasting, would be vulnerable to an attack by focusing on the word if, and that Jesus would then demonstrate his pedigree by giving a sign, performing a miracle. In this case, Satan's true attack is found when he offered the suggestion, command these stones to become bread. Satan went after hunger first. This is an attempt at using the physical nature of the human Jesus to tempt the divine attributes of God's Son. He knew that he could not defeat Jesus as God. That was shown in Job and Zechariah. But Satan thought he might have better luck against the human Jesus since he had shown such an ability to trick, deceive, lie, and steal the souls of men throughout history. He had two objectives with this attack. First, Satan tried to tempt Jesus into using his position in a way that was inconsistent with his God-ordained mission. Second, Satan's aim was to entice Jesus to use powers that were rightly his, but which he had voluntarily abandoned to carry out his mission. This is when we get to see Jesus' first response. And this is where we get to see the radical focus of Jesus in action, and where we can gain understanding on how to combat the attacks of temptation in our own lives. Verse 4, But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus has already been relying upon God to sustain him through the past 40 days of prayer and fasting in preparation for this very moment. And true to form, the author and finisher of our faith himself relies upon the written word of God. And I don't want to move too quickly past this because the principle here is vital for us today. When Jesus was attacked, he went to scripture for defense. That is the key for us. We cannot face temptation apart from what his word says from the Bible itself. When you come under temptation's attack, open your Bible and read it. 
appeal to his word. Don't try to face this on your own with nothing. Jesus went to the Bible and he quoted something that he had been living out in real time. He quoted Deuteronomy 8.3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This section of scripture is where God is reminding the people of Israel that he had been testing them for 40 years. And that during that time, they wanted for nothing. They needed food, manna. Their clothing never wore out. Water, bam, out of rocks. Protection, try a pillar of fire at night. Jesus now proves that you can absolutely trust God to be the great provider, and that by trusting in him and his word, you will overcome. Let's look now at Satan's second attack. This is found in verses 5, 6, and 7. Then the devil, taking him high up on a mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. This is where the narrative gets interesting, as there appear to be changes in locations of the temptations. Uh, But this isn't too difficult for us to understand. We've been studying Ezekiel for weeks, and Ezekiel's been taking places in visions. We just read about the visions of Zechariah. And again, we're talking about Jesus here in a spiritual battle with Satan, both from a spiritual realm. This temptation involves Jesus being shown all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The how is not important, because in both Matthew and Luke, the accounts affirm that the events happened. Instead, look at the statement that Satan makes about his authority. Though Satan claims all this authority and their glory have been delivered to me, this is a lie. In a sense, Satan is the ruler of this world, as John 12, 31 points out. But even in the fallen state of the world and the limited authority that Satan has, All true authority belongs to God alone. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the whole world, and all who dwell therein. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17 says, This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whom he wills, and sets it over the lowest of men. Here's the crux of what Satan is after. It's found in the phrase, if you will fall down and worship me. He wants to be God. And this temptation has two aspects. First is the obvious. Satan is tempting Jesus to break the first commandment. Second, The devil is offering a shortcut for Jesus' future reign in God's kingdom. Uh, Just a shortcut that that, uh, uh, cuts out the redemptive work of the cross and, and exchanges God most high for Satan. I mean, that's not a big ask, right? We get to see now Jesus' central response to the temptation. It's found in verse 8. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. See, Satan tried the direct approach and offered Jesus kingship without suffering in this temptation. But Jesus ended that quickly. This is the first time we see this attack, but Jesus sees it again in Matthew 16, 23. Again, after a high point, the Mount of Transfiguration. Right afterwards, temptation. He rebukes Peter, and he says, Get behind me, Satan. In the case of Peter, Satan tries a subtle approach and uses situations and the people's messianic expectations to tempt Jesus into a course away from the redemptive plan that God had intended for him to fulfill. That is why Jesus rebukes Peter and again points back to God the Father. James chapter 4, 
verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. The only way to resist the devil is by submitting to God and drawing near to him. Satan has to flee. He's defeated by our obedience, just like he was in Christ. And again, Jesus doesn't do this on his own, but always submits to God and points back to Scripture as his backup and as his support. Jesus demonstrates for us what sin really is. It's putting things before God. When we sin, we actually are choosing to serve ourselves, our desires, our wishes, our plans. We substitute the perfect for the imperfect. We take a shortcut that we think will make us happy. But in reality, all we've done is put something ahead of God. Jesus identifies that Satan is the constant enemy of God. His sole purpose is to subvert the will of God. And he will use every single trick in the book to get his way. And the key for us here today is to use the same radical focus of Jesus and follow in his example. Don't sit and dwell in temptation. Reject it and move on. Now we're going to look at the third attack from Satan, which shows the cunning and the deception that Satan always tries to use. This is found in verses 9, 10, and 11. It says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. In this case, Satan is trying to use scripture to try to trip up Jesus by incorrectly applying Psalm 91. And he will do the same thing to you and I. As a matter of fact, this temptation is the one that highlights the very reason it is so important to be in the word for yourself and to check what you hear and what is preached and taught. Don't just accept the word of pastors because they come up to a pulpit like this. Test the words against scripture itself. And more importantly, be like Jesus, who was always ready in prayer. Because the Holy Spirit was Jesus' counselor. The Holy Spirit is our counselor and will teach us all things according to John 14, 26. This brings us to Jesus' final response. Verses 12 and 13. And Jesus answered and said, It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. See, Jesus remains consistent in his practice of overcoming temptation. And after he defeats Satan, Luke writes that the result of this battle is that Satan leaves until a later time. Basically, this means this battle isn't over yet. The final radical focus of Jesus is what we're going to look at now. He was always ready. He knew that his enemy would be coming back and that he always needed to be prepared spiritually. Now, you might be saying to yourself right now, well, this is Jesus, right? Of course he responded in the right way. I'm not Jesus, so how can this help me? In 2003, I had a, a squad of Marines, and we were out on a patrol. And as we were on the patrol, my uh, point man called me up and said, Corporal Anderson, what is this? And as soon as I saw it, I said, freeze. And because of our training, because of the doctrine of the Marine Corps, everybody immediately froze. What was at his feet was a landmine. And had we, I don't know how we missed it. I don't know how we were there, but we didn't know if there were more of them or anything. So what we did was I told everybody, we're going to turn around and we're going to walk back in our own footprints and we're going to get out of here. If anyone in my squad had taken a step outside of the ones we had already make, they were taking the risk that they would step on a mine. But by walking back in the steps that we had already laid, 
we knew we would make it out safe. We should place our footprints in the steps that Jesus laid. Jesus was spirit-led. Jesus was spirit-fed. And Jesus was spiritually ready. And with Jesus as our Savior, as our guide, we can be also. See, the radical focus of Christ is attainable. There's no trick. There's no secret. In fact, it's so simple that it has confounded the wise and stumbled the proud for ages. The message of the cross is the answer. The place where Jesus bore the iniquities of all upon himself and cried out in suffering, but also cried out in victory. It is finished. He submitted to the will of God, never once losing that focus. And ultimately, he made a way for all of us to share in that victory. We must follow in his footsteps and submit ourselves and accept his free gift of salvation from eternal death. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your victory. Jesus, I thank you that you went to the cross willingly and you bore our sin, our shame, and the Lord, you did it happily for each one of us. Lord, I ask that you help us to walk in your footsteps. Lord, I ask that you would help us to know when we need to uh, run away from temptation. Lord, help us to be in your word. Help us to follow your radical focus so that we can do what's right. Lord, I thank you. I praise you for your message. I praise you for your word. And it's in your precious and holy name that I pray. Amen.